Sometimes, after decades of questions, finding a perpetrator doesn't always end the mystery. On July the 26th, 1974, 12-year-old Leslie Metcalf was walking along the Race Point Dunes of Provincetown, Massachusetts, before a dog ran ahead of her family, frantically barking. She decided to follow the alarmed animal to discover the decomposing remains of a young female. The body was only mere yards away from the busy road, but was infested with insects. The woman was found lying face down on half of a beach blanket. A blue bandana and a pair of Wrangler jeans were found underneath her head. She had long auburn or red hair which was pulled back into a ponytail by a gold flecked elastic band and she had pink painted toenails. It was initially believed that she was 5 foot 6 but later concluded to be 5 8. Weighed 145 pounds with an athletic build and she had received some expensive dental work including crowns, which cost thousands of dollars. Furthermore, several of her teeth had also been removed. The woman was estimated to be somewhere between the ages of 25 to 40, though some believe she could have been as young as 20, while others were convinced as old as 49. Both of her hands were missing, as was one of her forearms, and she was nearly completely decapitated, most likely from strangulation. The cause of death was one side of her head being crushed by a military type entrenching tool. However, despite the horrific nature of the injuries, there were no signs of a struggle, suggesting that she knew the killer and was comfortable around them, or that she was murdered in her sleep. There were some signs of possible sexual assault, but it more than likely happened after she was already dead. A set of size 10 footprints were found leading from the body, suggesting that they were running at the time, and some tyre tracks were around 50 yards away, believed to have been caused by a four-wheel drive sand vehicle. It was concluded that she may have been dead for around 10 days or up to three weeks before being discovered. Investigators believed that the murderer had removed the teeth, hands and forearm in an attempt to conceal the victim's identity or their own. The authorities searched through thousands of missing person cases, used sniffer dogs as well as searching for any permits to gain approval of vehicles being let into the area, but they found nothing. There was no physical evidence discovered at the scene of the crime and it seemed like an impossible to solve murder. The beach blanket nor the sand were disturbed, which suggested that the body had been transported there after the killing. Local Margie Child stated, quote, The fact no one could identify the Lady of the Dunes in the tight-knit community was very strange. End quote. Due to the expensive dental work which was described as being of New York style, the authorities searched across the entire United States for any dentist who may have conducted this work on the woman, but none came forward. Sadly, with no leads, the woman was buried in October of 1974, and the case went cold. It wasn't until 1979 when a facial reconstruction was made out of clay to hopefully identify the mysterious woman, but nobody came forward. A year later and her remains were exhumed from her grave for further analysis, but sadly no further evidence was found. But as the years rolled by, the case seemed to slowly gain a bit more traction. In 1981, investigators discovered the story of a woman who was spotted with mobster Whitey Bulger around the time of the murder. Not only did she resemble the body, but he was commonly known for removing the teeth of his victims, specifically Debbie Davis, who was also strangled, though her hands weren't removed. This was corroborated by Sandra Lee, who was nine years old at the time of the murder, who claimed that her family were closely associated with Bulger. She claimed to have even seen him in town on the day of the discovery. But even more bizarrely, she claimed that she had actually found the body that day before Leslie Metcalf, but didn't alert the authorities. Bolger was convicted of 11 murders, but most believed that he was actually responsible for a lot more. However, there was no definitive link between him and this particular killing, and he was discarded as a potential suspect, later being murdered in prison. 
In 1987, an unnamed woman from Canada confided in a friend that she witnessed her father strangling a woman in Massachusetts around 1972. The authorities did attempt to locate this woman, but were unsuccessful. However, this was two years before the Lady of the Dunes was discovered, making it very unlikely, if not impossible, to have been the same person. Another woman came forward to claim that the facial reconstruction strongly resembled her sister who had vanished from Boston in 1974, but nothing ever came of this. Two other possibilities were that the victim was Frances E. Waltz from Montana or Vicki Lamberton from Massachusetts, both of which had been missing for some time, but they were both ruled out as being the victim. During the 1980s, a psychic came forward to claim that the victim was a Canadian nurse named either Caroline or Marilyn O'Leary. This was also corroborated by another local who claims that the reconstruction strongly resembled a nurse called Caroline O'Leary. However, this person was located and she was very much alive and well. Another potential suspect was serial killer Tony Costa, who operated around the Truro, Massachusetts area. However, it turned out that he passed away on May the 12th, 1974, two months before the body was discovered, and he was erased from suspicion. Investigators then stumbled upon the case of criminal Rory Jean Kessinger, who would have been 25 years old at the time of the murder. She had broken out of jail in 1973 and authorities believed that she strongly resembled the victim and could have been the one killed that day. The theory is that the murderer would have been fully aware that Rory's fingerprints would be on file, which is why they removed her hands. She also had a history of bank robberies and attempting to shoot at police officers. Furthermore, she used a saw to escape from her jail cell, which could have been used against her to remove her hands. In March of 2000, the remains were exhumed once again to compare to Rory's DNA. And while the first test remained inconclusive, two years later, another was conducted, and it officially proved that Rory Jean Kessinger was not the Lady of the Dunes. And she was never seen again after escaping jail. It was that same year when convicted murderer Haddon Clark wrote a letter to a friend in which he admitted to murdering a woman on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. He also included two drawings. One was a handless naked woman sprawled on her stomach and another contained a map to where the body was found. While some reports claim it was in April of 2000, others claim December the 15th. But what is for certain is that Clark led investigators to the very spot where he claimed to have buried two victims 20 years prior, confessing to murdering several others across various different states between the 1970s and 90s. He claimed to have burned the evidence in his grandfather's garden, leading them there, which is where they found a plastic bucket containing over 200 pieces of jewelry. While they discovered class rings and trophies from other high school victims, there were no further signs of the Lady of the Dunes. Haddon Clark stated, quote, I could have told the police what her name was, but after they beat the shit out of me, I wasn't going to tell them shit. This murder is still unsolved and what the police are looking for is in my grandfather's garden, end quote. He claimed to have struck the woman in the head with a fishing rod before using a saw to remove her hands. He then claimed to have used her fingers as fishing bait before burying the hands elsewhere. His confession, however, was largely dismissed as the details provided were only public knowledge from the newspaper. And he had a history of false confessions in other murders. And experts were convinced that he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, which can often lead to false confessions. In May 2010, a CT of the woman's skull was carried out, which was then used to generate images to create another physical reconstruction by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. In 2014, one of the investigators actually helped to raise funds for the victim to be given a brand new casket, as the original one had rusted and become far too deteriorated. But in August 2015, the story began to get stranger. 
The son of legendary author Stephen King, Joe Hill informed authorities that there is an extra in the Steven Spielberg feature film Jaws that strongly resembled the Lady of the Dunes, even wearing the exact same clothes, which was shot on Martha's Vineyard only around 100 miles south of where the body was found between May and October 1974. Universal were contacted regarding this, but they didn't have a record of all of the names of the extras, and the casting director had since passed away. This theory was soon dismissed, with most considering it to be far too far-fetched and nothing short of wild speculation. But in 2022, the truth finally began to unravel. The skeletal remains were sent off to Othram, where a DNA profile was generated with new advanced investigative genealogy technology, which was often used to identify distant relatives. And on Halloween that year, the FBI officially announced, after 48 years, three months and five days, that the Lady of the Dunes was in fact 37-year-old Ruth Marie Terry. Ruth Marie Terry was born on September the 8th, 1936 in Whitwell, Tennessee to Johnny and Eva, the latter of which would sadly pass away at the age of just 23. It was in 1957 after a short-lived marriage when Ruth left Whitwell to relocate to Livonia, Michigan, where she began work at the Fisher Body Automotive Plant. The following year, she gave birth to her son Richard, but unfortunately was unable to care for him properly due to financial difficulties. She ended up allowing the superintendent at her work, Richard Hanchett Sr to adopt him in return for him paying off all of her debts. After the adoption, Ruth once again relocated to California. It was in 1972 when she decided to try to reach out to her son, but he was suffering from a drug addiction at the time, ending up in a coma for 18 days and was unable to see her. On February the 16th, 1974, Ruth married Guy Rockwell Moldovan, a 50-year-old antiques dealer from Reno, Nevada. In March, the couple visited her family back in Whitwell, but her grandniece Britannic Novoglosky later recalled Ruth as not being herself when she was with him, claiming that he was showing possessive behavior. Not long after, they headed to Chattanooga, Tennessee to visit Ruth's half-brother Kenneth and his wife Carol. During this time, Ruth and Guy claimed that they were planning to travel across the United States States looking for antiques, even mentioning visiting Massachusetts in the near future. But sadly, Ruth wouldn't be seen alive again. In the summer that year, Moldovan returned to Tennessee to inform Ruth's family that she had vanished from their California home. According to her sister Jan Terry, Guy actually stayed with the family for a short while, but remained casual, simply stating that he just didn't know where she was, but not seeming overly concerned. Ruth's brother James headed to California himself and even hired a private investigator to try to find her. But he reported that all of her belongings were sold and that she had simply left the state on her own free will after becoming involved with a religious cult. Eventually, over the decade, she became listed as officially deceased in the family's obituaries after years with no answers. Though Carol was convinced that Ruth had been part of a witness protection program and was unable to contact the family for their own safety. Once Ruth was officially identified on November the 2nd, 2022, investigators decided to look into her husband. Guy Rockwell Moldovan was born on October the 29th, 1923 in New York City. However, he soon became an orphan and was adopted by Abram Albert Zadwaranski Moldovan and Sylvia Silberblatt, growing up with his brother, Michael Semyon Moldovan. By 1942, Guy attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, but would be disqualified from active service in the military during the Second World War due to a mastoid infection. On May the 11th, 1946, Moldovan married Joellen May Loop in Bellevue, Pennsylvania. The couple lived in New York before relocating to California and then again to Seattle, Washington, where he worked as a disc jockey. Moldovan was also a suspect in the murder of 28-year-old bread truck driver Henry Lawrence Baird, as well as the disappearance of his 17-year-old waitress girlfriend, Barbara Jo Kelly, in June of 1950. Barbara was last seen on the 17th, leaving for their date in Humboldt County, California 
California. But Henry's body was later found face down on the beach near Table Bluff the next morning, having received a gunshot to the back of the head. He was completely naked, except for some shoes and socks. While Barbara's clothing was found nearby, carefully folded and tucked underneath the rest of his attire. However, no trace of Barbara was ever found, though it was widely believed that whoever murdered Henry had kidnapped her. Unfortunately, things wouldn't work out for Moldovan and his wife, and the couple would divorce on July the 16th, 1956. Just two years later, on September the 30th, his second marriage began with Manzanita Eileen Ryan in Cottonai, Idaho. Manzanita had a daughter from a previous marriage named Dolores Ann Means, who was just 18 years old at the time. But on April the 1st, 1960, both women mysteriously disappeared, and Moldovan was the prime suspect. He quickly fled Seattle, but was then arrested by the FBI and charged with unlawful flight to avoid giving testimony into their deaths. On July the 29th that year, Moldovan married for a third time to Evelyn Marie Emerson in Kings County, Washington, and the pair would even remarry again on August the 10th three years later in Los Angeles. His life of crime would continue, however, as he was charged for swindling his third wife's family out of $10,000 around the time his second wife had gone missing. In 1961, Guy Rockwell Moldovan was finally convicted of these charges and sentenced to 15 years in prison. However, by March the following year, the judge decided to suspend the sentence if Guy simply paid back all of the money. According to true crime writer Anne Rule, the authorities discovered dismembered human body parts in Moldovan's septic tank, but they were unable to prove that they were from the missing women, and therefore were unable to link him to their disappearances. She claimed that since there was no body, he wasn't able to be charged. Two years after the disappearance of his fourth wife, Ruth, Moldovan relocated again to Chihuahua, California. An article written in 1985 reported that he retired from his executive vice president job at a silver store on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, and he allegedly worked at the radio station Kazoo in Pacific Grove as a volunteer host for a three-hour weekly call-in show. Some reports claim that he also worked at a tobacco shop in Carmel as well. He would remarry again to a woman by the name of Phil but sadly, justice would never be met, as on March the 14th, 2002, 20 years before this investigation into him began, at the age of 78, Guy Rockwell Moldovan passed away in his home in Salinas, California, from a lengthy illness. It wasn't until August the 28th, 2023. After a lengthy investigation and 49 years of mystery, Guy Rockwell Moldovan was officially named as the murderer of the Lady of the Dunes. But while this question has been answered, many remain alluding to his motive and the full extent of his crimes over the years, and if he did find it within himself to finally stop his rampage, how and what prompted this? Despite most of the pieces being fit into the puzzle, this case continues to raise questions and continues to leave us seeking answers.